Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from the Frontier. Thank you, as always, for stopping by. Let me start with some macro thoughts. This certainly caught my attention. A bull market is like sex. It feels best just before it ends. Barton thinks. The Canadian loony, uh, the Canadian dollar, tumbled as the Saudis started to dump Canadian stocks and bonds. This is via Zero Hedge. Um, Canada's Prime Minister Trudeau isn't backing down. He said the country will always speak strongly, firmly, clearly and politely about human rights. We will continue to stand by and for universal values. He keeps getting mugged, first by Trump and now by the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. And I think there is no way he should apologize. Why should he apologize? And furthermore, if he did apologize, it would be political suicide. This is a chart of Dollar Canada. Um, last trading at 130.15. Um, and uh, it's a little difficult to call because I don't think uh, Canada-Saudi relations rank in the top ten of each other's. FT reports that the Saudi central bank and state pension funds have instructed their overseas asset managers to dispose of their Canadian equities, bonds and cash holdings, no matter the cost. So plenty of geopolitical and financial interplay here. We've gotten so numb with rotation, selling in emerging markets, that this is starting to look like a contagion. And this is what I was referring to when I wrote about the end of Hallison days from Latin Alcyone, the daughter of Iulius and the wife of Seeks. When her husband died in a shipwreck, Alcyone threw herself into the sea, whereupon the gods transformed them both into Hallison birds, kingfishers. When Alcyone made her nest on the beach, waves threatened to destroy it. Iolius restrained his winds and kept them calm during seven days in each year so she could lay her eggs. These became known as the Hallison days when storms do not occur. Today the term is used to denote a past period that is being remembered for being happy and or successful, I was basically saying. I thought we were going to have a bear market in emerging markets at that point in May. A male oriental dwarf kingfisher is captured feeding a female to seek her acceptance. Brexit chart sterling now down more than 10% against the dollar since mid-April. We were last trading at 128.80. Digital assets have now lost about $600 billion since crypto mania peaked in January more than the market value of all but the four biggest companies in the S&P 500 index. Peter Brandt, uh, referencing uh, Bitcoin head and shoulders, he says, have a look at his tweet, last trading at 6,340. Home thoughts, uh, have a look at my interview with Ian Craig of the Lewa Wildlife Conservancy, who's now been appointed to the board of the KWS. And I like this photograph, Crazy Horse, by David Yarrow. This photograph is very much made in Montana and has been received well by many of my friends in the state. Equally, however, I think it should appeal to all those that find a visceral pull towards the Wild West. Political reflections, obviously, this brouhaha is not about the merits of the burqa. It is about the leadership of Tory party at that point. J.P. Morgan says Trump may sell dollars as a weapon in the U.S. trade war. I think that's a bad idea and he should just let the dollar strengthen and have the rest of the world bow down to him. The U.S. has announced new sanctions on Russia that punish Putin's government for the March 4th nerve agent attack in the United Kingdom of a former double agent, Sergei Skripal, and his daughter. The sanctions are required under the 1991 Chemical and Biological Weapons Control and Warfare Elimination Act, 
which mandates punishment of countries that use chemical weapons in violation of international law. State Department officials said they expect them to take effect August 22nd. The sanctions welcomed by the UK added to pressure on the ruble that began earlier in the day when Russian media published the full text of a separate bill proposed by US lawmakers that seeks crushing sanctions for election interference. The currency sank to its lowest level since November 2016. I've written about this severally. About the street palace here, I cannot be certain, but he certainly he interfered with the US election. And I wrote a piece called We Have a Deviate Tomahawk around those dates. The Russian ruble plunged more than 3% as US is imposing new sanctions uh, on Russia. Um, so we've got plenty of volatility there in the mix now as well. Is Xi Jinping's bold China grab starting to backfire? A few months ago, Xi Jinping seemed unstoppable. He just abolished presidential term limits and announced the most sweeping government overhaul in decades. Having hosted Donald Trump for a successful visit in November, Xi seemed to have prevented a trade war with the U.S. Party. With the U.S. Party propagandists were distributing hagiographic accounts of the newly anointed leader for life. Today's China's president looks like he may have overreached an economic slowdown, a tanking stock market, and an infant vaccine scandal are all feeding domestic discontent, while abroad in Western capitals and financial centers there's a growing wariness of Chinese ambitions. And then there is the escalating trade war with the US. China initially refused to believe it would happen, but in the past few weeks it's become the prism through which Xi's perceived failings are best projected. Calling it a summer of discontent, the trade war has made China more humble, says Wang Yiwei, a professor of international affairs at Renmin University in Beijing, Xi Jinping's thought center. We should keep a low profile, he says, even suggesting that China should rethink how it implements Xi's flagship Belt and Road infrastructure project. In May, entering trade negotiations with the US, China projected swagger and self-confidence. Xi dispatched his top economic advisor to the US with the official designation of his personal envoy, Liu returned to proclaim victory. There would be no trade war, he said in a nationally televised interview. Then came the shock. Trump imposed $50 billion in tariffs on China. There was a broad-based consensus building that China's behavior was predatory and it needed to be stopped. The casting off of term limits was a match on that gasoline and has acted as an accelerant for pushback in the US. Domestic criticisms have intensified too. People across the nation, including the entire bureaucratic elite, feel increasing uncertainty about the direction of the country and a deep sense of personal insecurity. And this is something I touched on when I asked tariff wars who blinks first. And I think clearly Xi Jinping is blinking. And I was talking about how Trump was bashing on EPN and bashing on Justin Trudeau. And it turned his attention to Xi Jinping and thrown him the keys, challenging him to a chicky run. Rebel without a cause, if you're interested in what a chicky run is. And I was saying, from a trading perspective, the fire starter, the chicky run specialist, is actually beginning to shake the Californians puzzled by Trump's failure to blame wildfires on Hillary Clinton. Maybe he's really distracted by all this Russia stuff and is off his game. Oppressing Uyghurs isn't the way to build the Belt and Road. This is Bloomberg opinion. The one country on earth which should best understand the danger and futility of such efforts has reportedly set up re-education centers across the length and breadth of the largest province, where political prisoners are instructed to repeat mantras about the greatness of the Chinese state and President Xi Jinping. They write self-criticisms late into the night. Observant Muslims are forced to drink alcohol. 
Persistent dissenters are allegedly subject to torture, including in a terrifying device known as a tiger chair. One recent academic study warns that anything between several hundred thousand and over a million residents of Xinjiang may have been sent to the camps. Um, the Chinese are arguing that the tiger chair is padded for comfort. There's another question that Chinese leaders and the rest of us should be asking, and that is, what does this repression mean for China's ambitions in Central Asia and beyond? The Silk Roads of the past went through what is now Xinjiang, and if the Belt and Road Initiative ever takes off, it is Xinjiang that will be its hub and its heart. I've spoken about Xinjiang severally and called it a laboratory experiment in control and state surveillance. Sterling cementing the move under 129, we're at 128.80 right now. Um, and I think we target 125 now. I have never seen this level of disregard for securities laws and blatant price manipulation. This is talking about Tesla and Elon Musk. In almost 30 years in the public markets, including as an executive for an NYSC public company that was taken private in a large LBO, I have never seen this level of disregard for securities laws and blatant price manipulation, which is the point I was making yesterday. Let's move on to the currency markets, Euro dollar 116.07, dollar index 95.07, Japanese yen 110.99, Swiss franc 0.9929, the pound 128.80, the Aussie 0.7438, India rupee 68.545, South Korean 111.1705, the real 377.16, Egyptian pound 17.8675 and the rand still in that trading range 13.3829. This is a chart of the dollar index via Adam Mancini who is still in that 94.96 range however I expect an eventual move to 100. The New Zealand dollar otherwise known as the Kiwi tumbled last trading at 0.6675. Dollar yen um, I think we're eventually moving to 105 uh, via 107, but the issue is, you know, we could go up as high as 114 before we make that move. So just keeping an eye on that for now. Gold, 1214.50 last. Crude oil had a bit of a had a poor session yesterday. Fell quite sharply. This is a chart from Chi Girl, uh, $66.54 trading. Oil had been largely immune from the escalating trade dispute. However, the recent application of tariffs by China on U.S. petroleum products does represent a step change for the energy market. Uh, WTI accrued for September delivery uh, tumbled $2.23 yesterday, lowest close since June 21. The yield on Argentina's century bond rose to a record 9.38%. Not sure what's going on outside, but there seems to be plenty of drama. Um, so that's signaling again the stress in EM and frontier market credits. Here's what you need to know ahead of India's upcoming general election, saying that Modi has reason to feel less confident about the coming general election than he once did. Uh, expecting it to be in the first quarter of 2019. The IMF is saying India's economy is an elephant that's starting to run. But it's also talking about risks. The rupee has plunged 7% against the dollar this year, for example. Let's move on to Africa. Congo coalition rules out President Kabila re-election bid. The conclusion of consultations under President Joseph Kabila Kabanga the moral authority of the Common Front for Congo has resulted in a name, the rare bird who will represent our political family in the presidential election. This is the government spokesman Lambert Mende told reporters in Kinshasa on Wednesday. It will be Comrade Emmanuel Ramazani Shadari. Shadari, 57, is the permanent secretary of Kabila's People's Party for Reconstruction and Democracy and a former interior minister. He's also one of nine Congolese sanctioned last year by the European Union, which accused them of undermining democracy and abusing human rights. 
uh, Kabila being ruled out as a candidate is a crucial first step toward ensuring a credible electoral process in the Congo, Ida Soya. Congo's presidential and parliamentary elections are set to take place on December 23rd. So far, three major opposition leaders, Jean-Pierre Bemba, Vital Kamarhe, and Felix Shishikedi, have registered to compete in the presidential election. Another, Moishi Katumbi, is being prevented from entering the country. So, I conclude by asking, will Kabila get to leave with all his swag? Uh, so, as we're reiterating, he's not going to run in the election. Ramazan Ishidari is the ruling party's candidate for elections in December. Last year in May, the EU sanctioned him because of his involvement in planning, directing, committing acts that constitute serious human rights violations in the DRC. There's a portrait of him in the Human Rights Watch. Congo Ebola vaccine teams up, teams set up fridges, 43 cases suspected. Ivory Coast former First Lady Simone Bagbo has been released from prison. She was seen in the same light as uh, that Rwandese fellow's wife, uh, Habriyama, you know, the, the, uh, I can't remember her name, but hardcore hardliner. So it's interesting that um, Watara seemed fit to uh, uh, release her. Zimbabwe needs help, but first must help itself, says Bloomberg. Mugabe's exit provides, even now, a real opportunity. For all its defects, this election was a significant improvement over previous contests. Over the long run, giving Zimbabweans a greater stake in their economic future will raise their expectations, increase their power at the ballot box, and improve their chances for a future as rich as the land they inhabit. Outsiders can help, but they should tell Manangagwa to lead the way. Then, the same uh, Bloomberg, Zimbabwe's renewal hopes dashed as vote disputes passed. Mayhem. Veritas, a Harare based legal rights group, said, Will everyone be able to see that the elections have been verifiably conducted according to the Constitution so that the outcome is acceptable to all? said in a statement. Regrettably, no, because the ZEC has shown so little transparency that there cannot be sufficient criteria for verifiability. Tendai Bitti, one of the principals of the opposition MDC alliance, has been arrested near the Chirundu border post with Zambia. Um, according to his lawyer, he was arrested on Zambian soil, where he intended to seek political asylum. 300 Zimbabwean travelers blocked their government security officers from arresting Tendai Bitti at the border with Zambia. According to a document circulating on social media that appears to be drafted by Zambia's Criminal Investigation Department, the document states Zambian officials then intervened and threatened to arrest the Zimbabwean officers for executing that mandate on Zambian soil. A team of Zambian paratroopers armed with AK-47 rifles later arrived at the Chirundi border post and took Mr. Bitti away, the document says. Zambia's Foreign Minister Joe Melanji told the BBC Mr. Bitti's asylum request has been turned down. Mr. Bitti fled to Zambia after Zimbabwe police issued an arrest warrant for him, accusing him of unlawfully announcing that his party's leader Nelson Chamisa defeated President Emerson Mnangagwa in last Monday's presidential election. And then, according to a tweet after the so-called arrest of Tendai Bitti today, the life of our President Nelson Chamisa is increasingly now at risk. He is on the warrant, apparently, that is being issued to arrest Bitti. So plenty of drama, but on balance, I think the international community is keen to re-engage. And we'll look through this noise at some point, with circumspection. MTN slumps on return of Iran troubles and surge in net debt. Debt levels are high. I hope they will address that with the 260 million euros they made from Cyprus, um, looking to reduce debt and then talking about the problems in Iran. Trading volumes dwindle on Africa's biggest bourse as South Africa's policy risks mount down by sharply. Dollar versus Rand, kind of mid range, 13.3829. Nigerian all shared down 5.08% year-to-date. Ghana Stock Exchange up 11.09% year-to-date.
quite dramatic developments here in Kenya today. Star Kidero arrested as Haji hits the judiciary. The Anti-Corruption Commission has said it has been conducting investigations into allegations of abuse of office, money laundering and bribery against Dr. Kidero and others. This is the DPP's press statement about anti-corruption. And clearly the uh, DPP and the uh, ODPP are bearing their fangs. Northern Haji has also directed investigations relating to management of public funds at the Kenyan judiciary. The Kenyan shilling was lasted at 100.44. Nairobi all share up 1.39% year to date. Bob is on fire, tweets Kenyan Wall Street. Safaricom rallied 1.7699%. It plays at 28.75 yesterday. If you're interested in the share price data, the link is there on Rich Wrap Ups. NSC20 is down 10.53% year to date. Foreigners, uh, once the cap was removed from the amount of shares foreigners can hold, have taken up more than 75% um, of the shares in BOC, Stanbig, Scan Group, Standard Chartered, um, above the 75% cap. Once again, thank you for books, for coming by.